Welcome to webinar number three in our series on OCT interpretation. I'm Dr. Julie Radman. In this webinar, I'm going to delve into the complications associated with diseases of the vitromacular interface, including the development of macular holes. In the previous webinar, I introduced the topic of vitromacular interface disorders. On this OCT scan, you can see the blue arrows pointing to the area that would be affected in vitromacular interface disorders. We spent quite a lot of time in the last webinar talking about the normal aging of the vitreous body, including the liquefaction and contraction of the vitreous. The processes of liquefaction and contraction of the vitreous lead to the eventual development of a posterior vitreous detachment or separation of the posterior hyaloid from the macula. We also talked about situations where the posterior hyaloid does not separate normally from the central macular surface, resulting in vitromacular traction formation. Oftentimes, VMT will resolve spontaneously. However, when it does not, it results in a myriad of complications, and I want to talk about some of those in this webinar. One of those is the development of cystoid macular edema. So you can see on this, slit, this scan, that the vitreous is again focally pulling at the fovea, resulting in the formation of these hyporeflective areas which are cystoid fluid. If the vitreous does detach, those areas of cystoid fluid will spontaneously resolve. Another complication involves the development of subretinal fluid. We oftentimes think about vitromacular traction affecting the superficial retina and the inner retinal space. However, in cases where there is chronic traction or when the traction is significant enough, the outer retinal tissue can become involved and can result in subretinal fluid formation. The hyporeflective area that the blue arrow is pointing to is the development of this subretinal fluid. And what we worry about in these situations is that the ISOS junction is usually affected and this will result in significant reduction in visual acuity. Another complication involves a distortion of the retinal layers, which you can see on this OCT scan, where there is, it's going to be very complicated to delineate the various retinal layers because the chronic traction from the vitreous on the retina has really distorted the anatomy. Another complication of VMT is the development of a lamellar macular hole. A lamellar macular hole is a partial thickness macular hole. So it's important to remember that in partial thickness macular holes, the outer retinal tissue is still intact. OCT is really, really great for diagnosing lamellar holes because they have a very characteristic appearance on OCT. What it will look like is an anvil-shaped lesion, again, separating the inner retinal tissue from the outer retinal tissue. You may also see schesis-like cavities within the inner retinal tissue. So the, the blue arrows here are pointing to that very characteristic anvil-shaped lesion where you can actually see the separation in the tissue. What we don't want to see happen is for a patient to, to develop a full thickness macular hole. Some patients are predisposed, however, to developing these full thickness macular holes. These are patients that have an abnormally tight adhesion between the vitreous and the central macula. So in these people, during the process of posterior vitreous detachment evolution, that focal traction on the fovea will result in the development of a full thickness macular hole. And again, the way that we kind of differentiate these from a lamellar hole is that all of the tissue from ILM to RPE is affected. So this slide shows a stage one full thickness macular hole where you can see the development of a pseudocyst formation. A stage two macular hole will involve the partial opening of the pseudocyst with focal vitreous attachment. So the blue arrow here is pointing to that residual vitreous attachment on the retina resulting in a pulling or an opening, resulting again in a pseudocyst formation. In a stage three hole, we have the release of the vitreous traction with operculum formation. And the blue arrow is pointing to the operculum, which you can see suspended or attached to the vitreous, again, resulting in a full thickness defect from ILM all the way to RPE. You can also see those cystoid hyporeflective spaces, both on the nasal and temporal side of the fovea there that we talked before about being complications of that chronic traction from the vitreous. In a stage four hole, 
This is a complete PVD where now you cannot see the vitreous anymore. It has probably been displaced too far anterior to be captured on the scan. You can also see some schesis like cavities, which again we talked about before, happening from that chronic tractional force of the vitreous. Another entity that kind of goes into this topic of vitreal retinal interface disorders is the formation of an epiretinal membrane. An epiretinal membrane is a thin hyperreflective sheet that overlies the inner limiting membrane. It can be the result of various things such as uveitis, retinal tears, or retinal detachments, but in the setting of a posterior vitreous detachment, we usually say that it has something to do with pieces of the posterior hyaloid or residual posterior hyaloid that forms a scaffolding or a proliferation of cellular material on the surface of the macula. So depending really on the severity of the epiretinal membrane, complications again can ensue. So these OCT scans show that proliferation or that scaffolding in the formation of a hyperreflective thin boundary at the anterior surface of the OCT. That's what those blue arrows are pointing at. You can also see on the left-hand side that there is a lamellar hole formation. Again, you can see that anvil-shaped characteristic appearance on the OCT. The one on the right is a pseudo, I'm sorry, is a partial thickness pseudo hole, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. So one of the complications, again, of strong forces being imposed by the epiretinal membrane would be distortion of the inner retina. So here again, you can see that large scaffold and hyperreflective area. You can see almost a sawtooth appearance of the ILM, which is trying to kind of connect itself to that strong epiretinal membrane. And because of that, there is a distortion of the inner retinal tissue. The outer nuclear layer, the outer plexiform layer, the inner nuclear and inner plexiform layers are all distorted due to that tractional force. Another complication of ERM would be a foveal schesis. Again, separation of the inner and outer retinal tissues by these column-like um, areas or column-like lesions that you can really see very well almost by those vertical lines on the OCT scan. The one on the left-hand side does not have a hole. The one on the right-hand side, again, shows the development of a lamellar macular hole or partial thickness macular hole, again, visualized by that anvil-shaped lesion. Another thing that can happen from chronic ERM or strong forces being imposed by the ERM would be a loss of the foveal contour. So again, on this slide, there is a complete absence of that foveal pit. And again, overall retinal thickening with, again, those sawtooth kind of formations adherent of the ILM to the epiretinal membrane. I mentioned briefly before a pseudo hole. A pseudo hole is another type of partial thickness hole that we usually think of associated with an epiretinal membrane. And again, it's partial thickness because you can see that there is still residual healthy outer retinal tissue there. And again, usually a complication of epiretinal formation, epiret epiretinal membrane formation. So I hope that you have a good understanding now of various complications associated with diseases of the vitreoretinal interface. And I hope that you will consider joining us for the next lesson on advanced interpretation of OCT.